welcome, welcome, welcome to Inspiring Life with Elizabeth. I am Elizabeth Browning, and um, tonight I am so excited to introduce to you our most wondrous guest, Christy Wilhelmy is the founder of Garden Nerd. I love that name, Garden Nerd, the ultimate resource for garden nerds where she publishes newsletters, her popular blog, top-ranked podcasts, and YouTube videos. Christy also specializes in small space organic vegetable garden design, consulting, and public speaking and teaching classes. Between 70 to 80% of her family's produce actually comes from her own garden of less than 300 square feet. She's the author of Gardening for Geeks, 400 plus tips for organic gardening success, Grow Your Own Mini Fruit Garden, and her upcoming novel, Garden Variety, which will be in stores and online this April. Let's give a very warm welcome to Christy Wilhelmy. Welcome! You're Yay, here. You. You're here. Thank you so much for coming. Absolutely. So your life is really inspiring to me for many reasons. Um, you have been a performing artist. You have done a number of other things. And then you've stepped into this amazing new art form that I see as living art. And um are, are actually creating quite a stir and really awakening people to the power of having a garden. So um, before we start talking about gardening itself, I would love for you to just take us on a little, a little journey of your, um, how you started and how you got to where you are now. How I did? Well, I guess you could say I started as a dancer. <laughs> my parents put me in dance class at three and a half years old so that I would have something to do with my energy. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I was a handful. And the so I stayed, I was a dancer. That was my identity for my whole life until, uh, and I, I danced professionally. I was in dance troops and I toured nationally with a dance um, of a pre-Broadway, they called it a pre-Broadway musical. And I had my own tap dance company and did a uh, dance on a cruise ship and did a bunch of stuff. And then I transitioned as my body got a little older, I transitioned into professional swing dancing where the swing dance team that I was on won three national jitterbug championship titles in team oh division. Oh my god! So I was on the team for two of those. That was fun. And, uh, and that, but it's inevitably swing dancing is what took me out <laughs> so I got injured I got oh. injured and it it was an ankle injury and so I just I tried to heal it and it didn't heal so it happened to happen it just happened at the same time as I was I was building up garden nerd because um, mm. I was working a day job of course doing that kind of stuff because <laughs> Very few people make their living as as dancers or actors. I was also in, I went to acting school and all of that, and was a model for a time, a hair model. Anyway, I so, totally um, believe it. Right? You could still be a hair model. Well, they thank you. They uh, they could turn it any color they wanted except blonde, and that was my, <laughs> like, and they'll do anything, just not blonde. Um, so that was that was a fun time. But then when I when I uh, as I was transitioning into garden nerd, um, I got injured. And so I was like, okay, here we are. And uh, I created garden nerd because somewhere along the way in my early twenties, I had, I found out what my life purpose was supposed to be. And, and I was, I was trying to figure out how to merge my life purpose with what I like to do and what I'm good at. And wow. so that turned out to be garden nerd, at least right now. So can you <laughs> elaborate? I'm all, my radar always, my antenna goes ding, 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 ding. It's like when somebody says, this is my life purpose. Like I know what I'm here to do. Can you elaborate a little bit on that and how that joins with garden well, nerd? And 
Sure. So I, f I feel like I was put on the planet to perform, uh, to be in front of an audience. And, and it's not so much to get that, you know, the high that comes from performing, but it is because that's where, where, like, what else am I going to, what else am I supposed to do? That's who I am. So, um, so that was, that was a really important piece, but Garden Nerd gave me a chance to build a platform for myself as an expert in gardening, which I, I will explain how I got into gardening. Cause you have, I think you were going to ask me about that at some point, but, uh, it allowed me to build, build this platform for myself as an expert and help people, which according to my, uh, my hands, I am a successful mentor of artists. And so the, the, that, whole life purpose has a gestation period of 50 to 60 years and I was not going to wait around for that so I just started <laughs> like come on now so um gardener seemed to make it uh, possible for me to mentor people while I aged <laughs> I actually I I love that because I I was thinking about gardening right and I was thinking about the fact that it is very much an art form and it's a living art and there is a dance that takes place between you and other living beings and then to bring that to the public and to awaken people to the kind of magic that they can have in their own home or in their own backyard um, it is i think a deeply spiritual act and i know when i go out into to nature, I come alive. And then I also joke that when plants see me coming, they just like fall over dead in advance because it just speeds <laughs> up the process for them. But in truth, it's just because I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to take care of them. Um, and so I would love for you to elaborate a little, and we are gonna talk about the really cool things that I've already learned just from getting to know you and listening to some of your podcasts, but the spiritual aspect of gardening in terms of how it can change your psyche, how it can help heal a life, how, can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think you have an insight that a lot of people don't have. Yeah, I've, I find that when I work with people for the first time, if they've never gardened before, they hold a seed in their hand and they are absolutely aghast, just flabbergasted that they're like, this is going to turn into a head of lettuce, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and it's the, the miracle of the seed. And it's sort of almost a cliche now in my world. We're like, yeah, well, it's a miracle of the seed, of course, but it, it really is. It's a miracle. And so there's this well, for me, I, I tell my students, nature always wins. You know, everything mm -hmm. we can try to to win in the garden, but it's really nature always has the last word. And so, when we're we're trying to garden, it's best to work with Mother Nature instead of against her. And so that expanded awareness of uh, you know observation is one of the key skill sets in. Mm -hmm in permaculture and in biointensive gardening and just in gardening in general and being able to open your awareness to what's going on, observing your surroundings, really tapping into what the space is offering and what it's giving back, you know, what, what it needs from us or, you know, if anything and how to get out of its way. And um, I feel like there are, there's so many times when the garden feels like church for me, you know, mm. um, cause I grew up Catholic and left the church for a number of reasons and never found that, that the comfort of ritual that the church offers, you know, there's a certain ritual experience that comes with going to church and doing the things that churches do. And for me, I find the seasonality of the garden going from cool season to warm season to way too hot to garden to too cold to start things to then 
starting it all over again. That's sort of a liturgical calendar in its own right. And it's fun to start anew and refreshed every year. So it has this, it's a built in with the seasons is a built in sense of renewal. And it feels, and there's a miracle that's happening. It's like right. there's a miracle that we can't see because the seed goes into the ground and then we take these steps and then we wait and we doubt and mm -hmm. we wonder if anything's ever going to happen. Um, but there's certain things. And then this, this amazing thing emerges that just like you said, somebody goes, this is going to be a cabbage. I, I have to tell you, this is... I had surgery recently, it was minor surgery, and a friend of mine sent me um, these beautiful tulips. And it was the day of the surgery, and so I sort of slept through the day. I looked and went, ugh. And then when I woke up that night, they were all like completely collapsed over the vase because I didn't know that there wasn't any, nobody realized there wasn't water. water. And it was actually this this experience, I went, oh, oh my God, I'm so sorry. And I, and I told them I was sorry. I trimmed the edges and literally they were hanging over. I put water in and then I left and I came back and they were standing again. And I just went, oh my God. And we went on this journey together. I knew they'd already been cut. I knew there was just a limited amount of time, but then every day I was grateful and I was trimming them and and they lasted for like two weeks and then as they changed they just became more and more beautiful and I went I so get it and I so haven't gotten it that there's this amazing thing that comes with supporting life around you so I'm scared of it because I have had more plants not live than live so um so tell me, like, when was the moment or how did you start? You weren't like always a gardener and you were in your apartment in LA, right? Yeah, actually I was in Orange County before I went to college at UC Irvine. So I was in Orange County and I had a balcony and not really any sun, but I, it's very connected. My, my connection or my uh, diving into gardening very much is connected to becoming a vegetarian. Oh, uh, and the more I learned about our food system, the more I want to control over it. And I just was like, God, OK, we got to do something about this. So I started growing things in containers on a balcony. And then I got um, moved to L.A., got a, an apartment with a patio. I was like, Ooh, more room. And then and then I saw I drove by this community garden and I was like, pull over and saw the, you know, it was back then you had to apply via post office box. And I <sighs> wrote them and asked for an application and they mailed it to me and I filled it out and mailed it back. And eight months later, I got a plot. Now the waiting list on that same garden, which I am still at is uh, about four to five years. So oh, wow. uh, yeah, so I got in there and after a year or so of working you know working on my plot there uh i you know i was a voracious reader and i studied everything i could people started asking me questions about gardening and i could answer them and then they were like you know you should do this for a living and so you know the, the, the those crazy words that people listen to uh when they do that so i listened to them and started plotting my escape from my day job and and uh, in 2008, I took the leap and left my day job and started Garden Nerd full time. And I created a podcast and a blog post, you know, I have a blog and a podcast. Those were the earliest things. And the, it started out as just like a t-shirt shop on Cafe Press where you can still go and get Garden Nerd shirts if you want one. And you have to show off your newest, hottest off the presses thing that arrived. Right, yes. Yeah. So the this, I haven't even loaded it up to the books to the to the store yet where because I'm going to be offering autograph copies but um but so there are books and other things in the store and and then I started doing a YouTube channel but I've mostly all along started I did design and installation classes and consulting so I started teaching a course at SMC Santa Monica College and I still do uh, I've been teaching it three times a year since 2008 and 
um, it's a great place for beginning gardeners to get started. And so with, uh, I, I wrote a book called Gardening for Geeks that came out in 2013. And then I revamped it, updated it. Oh, Kate has a copy right there. I saw someone um, holding, that's what I saw yes. someone holding it. It's Yay. like, thank you, Kate. Uh, and, and then, so the reissued copy came out last, well, actually the beginning of 2020. Uh, right before COVID, <laughs> that was the last oh. party we had before we locked down. And then I wrote Grow Your Own Mini Fruit Garden during COVID-19. And, uh, and it is, uh, it is now, it'll be out April. Well, they just told me Monday that it'll be out April 20th. The original published date was March 6th and it kept getting delayed and delayed and delayed because of various publishing uh, issues, shipping mostly. It's sitting in, it was sitting in a container somewhere out there in the ocean. <laughs> for the a US Canal, perhaps. <laughs> I went, no, it wasn't. I'm grateful I got it before then. But um, so, yeah. And then uh, you had mentioned in the beginning that I have a novel that, the, so this is the book, this Grow Your Own Mini Fruit Garden is the one coming out this year. My novel, Garden Variety, is coming out next spring 2022 and that is set in a community garden oddly enough <laughs> and it's in los angeles community garden it is it's a los angeles community garden so it's all about the california growing the southern california growing cycle which is very different from everywhere else so uh we you know most gardening books are written for places that get snow <laughs> we don't get that so and so my guess that. is that the characters in the book, I'm just guessing, are probably very diverse and all have unique personalities based on the people who show up to a community garden. Right. Yes. And that's why I want to turn it into a TV series because yes. you can just cycle total great, awesome characters through the whole thing, season after season. I'm like, this could go on forever. It'd be awesome. So that's what I want to do. And uh, my agent, who I'm just like still pinching myself that I got an agent, uh and a book deal in the same year weirdly um they're they're pitching to production companies now to <gasps> i totally see there. this happening we're all going to hold the vision that we're going to be watching the television series laughing and crying and going we heard her talk about this before the book ever came out so we're going to hold the vision for that Thank so you. i have a couple of before and after pictures that i was smitten with because i've come to realize just in the time i've gotten to know you that you can take almost any space and turn it into something that's nurturing and beautiful and that will feed us but and organic food I do know this much is so much more nutritious than what you would go to the grocery store. So I'm going to just show a couple of the before and afters. If you could just talk about them. This was, this was a property in uh, Sierra Madre and it was grass and they wanted a vegetable garden. They just wanted to, they actually work in that building off to the left with the door and the two windows. And so this couple wanted to come out into their garden and and this was one of the early projects that I did. And I originally had drawn up something for them that was a lot more angular. And she, the woman in the couple, she looked at it and she's like, nope, nope, this isn't, this isn't right. It needs to be more like, just uh, like it belongs in, like it's really anchored here and it, and it's more natural looking. And I was like, okay. And I, I was nervous because I didn't know if I was going to be able to fulfill that. And I, I did this other drawing and it came up and she, she looked at it and she's like, this is exactly right. And she said, did, did you know you had this in you? And I said, no. <laughs> and, uh, and so she says, well, see, you do. And so that was a being that that took place pretty early on in my career uh, as a, as a designer, a garden designer, it was very fortifying and bolstering and um, in making it so that like, okay, my ideas actually have value and worth and, uh, and I should trust my instincts on this because I can I read love, it. I can, yeah. I can no, I just love that well. story because the things we're most afraid of or that we don't think we're going to be able to do 
if we just take the step, sometimes we, we dazzle ourselves and other people. Yeah. Oh, right. And this one, so this was again, another early garden. It's funny. I haven't put any of my more recent gardens up on my website, but so this was a client who's, he's actually a, a advocate for 12 step programs, been through it himself a uh, big yoga guru type guy now. And, um, and he wanted to turn this strip of really dead looking land next to his driveway into something in Venice. Uh, and so he wanted to use all recycled lumber. So I, I sourced a recycled lumber uh, dealer and we built this 22 foot long, four foot you know, wide section of garden and divided it with reclaimed concrete into four by four sections so that you could walk into the beds without compressing the soil. And we brought in great soil and we planted and planted and planted lots of stuff, mostly from seed because they were really eager to grow unique varieties that aren't available at the nurseries. And they lived off this for a long, they loved it. They absolutely loved it. And oh my, and it's yeah. beautiful too. I mean, it literally looks like a work of art. It's that's, and then this is fascinating because this was just a little patch of ground next to, it looks like a hot tub, right? Yeah. And they wanted, so this lady, she had, she had rabbits. So we had to put up the rabbit fence around it. <laughs> it kind of ruins the look, but kept the rabbits from coming in and eating all the food, but she just, we wanted to carve out a little space on this big lawn that was otherwise uh, for kind of kids running around and stuff. And so we put in a curved border and put in a raised bed and then put in some potted plants and a mound, a crescent shaped mound with herbs in it. And uh, it was, uh, so it's this little herb culinary kitchen garden tucked off to one side. So they still had a lot of room to play volleyball. That's what they, they always <laughs> played as a family played volleyball. So like the lawn stays. So th that was a big deal. So we used this <laughs> tiny corner and got a lot out of it. Oh, I love that. Yeah. And then I love this picture. These are raising your babies inside before they're ready to go out. And, yes. and you can do certain things, even if you're in a little, I think to myself, oh, well, when I lived in the city, it's because I lived in the city or I don't have enough space, but you can really do something anywhere if you want to, right? Yeah. And for those who don't have any room or much sunlight, microgreens are always an option. And they're super, you know, everyone else knows about this more than I do, but they're antioxidant rich and, you know, really potent uh, with, with all the minerals and nutrients that they do have. So that's, you can just grow a flat, you fill a soil flat with, um, well, you fill a flat with soil and then plant, just scatter a bunch of seeds for brassicas, you know, broccoli, kale, et cetera, and then cover it with a little more soil, water it. And when it gets to the sprouting size, which you can see in that image in the middle is, I mean, I'm growing those to full size for planting out in the garden, but if you want to plant a whole seed tray full of that for microgreens, they're, you know, throw them in your smoothies, put them on your salad, et cetera. And then you've got lots of, uh, that's one of the ways to get your, your vitamins and nutrients that way. For my real gardeners who know what you're talking about, and for those, those of us who are just coming in with trembling knees going, I can do it, I can do it. Do you have, I mean, I, there's so many fascinating things that I've heard you say that I didn't even realize, but do you have any tips in terms of how people might get started and things that we may not know that would be useful? And then anything you wanna share with us because you are giving us a gift and it is like standing on a stage and communing with an audience and having everyone go, oh, thank you, this is a gift. So anything you wanna share? Oh gosh. Wow. Uh, open floor. Uh, so there's, uh, there's, there are a lot of things that people should keep in mind when they get started. First of all, failure is a learning opportunity. It isn't really failure. Uh, I mean, I, I think you've probably heard that said a lot. I kill a lot of plants. That is because I'm always experimenting and trying new things. And sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. And uh, so when people try and grow something and then it dies and they're like, well, I'm done. I'm like, no, you're not. You just tried once. And I've been trying for 20, like what every year for 15 years, I tried growing something and I'm like, I finally think I'm getting this, you know, and it's, it's just, it just depends on what it is, but there are certainly easier things to grow than others. Um, I always 
recommend when people are in a confined or you know, a small space where they don't have a lot to work with, focus on what I call the factory vegetables, which are things that send out growth from the center of the plant and you just pick the outer leaves like lettuces, spinach, mustard greens, arugula, um, kale, chard, those greeny things, they all grow from the middle of the plant and you just pick the outer leaves rather than picking the whole head of lettuce, you just pick the four or five outer leaves of each plant and that gives you enough for a salad for a couple of days and then it's going to keep growing and those same heads of lettuce will last you three to four months, you know, Wow. in the same wow. space. So it's really economical to grow in, you know, factory vegetables rather than like the one and done crops like carrots, right? So those, you pull it, it's done. <laughs> um, certain things are sort of a hybrid of that, like green onions, you can either pull the whole thing or you can just cut the greens, use the green parts, and then it'll keep growing. That's how I use them. Um, I grow a whole bed of green onions and I just pick the green parts and they keep regenerating for a whole season. And then I pull them all out at the end when they've gotten a little mucilaginous on the inside, which is a weird <laughs> trait for green onions to have. So I heard you talk about bugs and yeah. I was fascinated with this because it feels like everything you teach has like this really deep life lesson. Like if failure is really just a learning opportunity and then you say, well, that's one way that doesn't work. Let me try another way. How much further along we would all be in following our dreams and doing what we love if we didn't make the first or second or 10th failure mean something other than, all right, I keep to, and you talked a little bit to me about the power of moving through that. And, but then what it's like on the other side, um, I'm interested in bugs because I heard you talk about bugs and people are like, well, you have to kill the bad bugs because how else are you going to take care of your plants? And then I heard you talk and went, oh, there's so many answers that none of us know. Right. Well, there's this, the, one of the foundations of what I teach is about establishing your ecosystem. And it's about creating an environment in your yard or garden or patio or wherever where nature is helping more than hurting and uh, there's a balance. And so I don't know if any of you saw, I think the, one of the best examples of this, of what I'm talking about is the documentary about um, Apricot Lane Farms that came out a couple of years ago, right? Uh, that's uh, it's called The Biggest Little Farm. Uh, it took them eight years to build up their ecosystem to the point where the, the wildlife habitats that they created on site were doing the work for them to police the things they didn't want around. And it was great. Um, and so we, I encourage people to do that in their own yards in whatever space they have, because, you know, we've got, we've got room for flowers. We've got room for veggies. We've got, maybe we need a little help with um, maybe creating habitats for birds in the trees, uh, hanging little balls that are stuffed with lint and, and, um, you know, cotton and whatnot so that they can build their nests and old, like when you clean out your hairbrush, you stuff that <laughs> into the little ball and they take it off and do, and they're, they're going to come then police your kale for aphids. And then if you hang bird feeders, they come and instead of eating all the seeds out of your garden, ugh, when you've just planted them, they go to the feeder, right? And planting swaths of flowers in a three by three patch, uh, three foot by three foot patch in order to attract good bugs and pollinators to the garden that prey on the bugs that you don't want. So that that's the kind of, if you're going for balance, then you don't have to get every single bug off the plant. You know, that's not, that's, we're just kind of used to seeing that in the grocery store and how everything's perfect, but there's so much waste that's contributing to that perfection. And if we get mm. comfortable with the ick factor, that is like, it's okay if there's a little dirt or bugs on your stuff, they come off and, and you, you know, don't have to reach for bug spray. So I'm usually focused on pointing people's orientation and their observation in that direction so that they can start to see how they can build their ecosystem around them to support that kind of habitat and balance. I love that. And I love the idea 
that instead of fighting something, you bring in something that's actually going to solve the problem. And, and as you're talking about birds and flowers, I'm thinking, and you're creating something magnificent and really beautiful while nature takes care of itself. Yeah. And I, I, yeah. There are, you know, I just want to say there are, uh, there, I have on, you know, a short list of bugs that do have to be killed. And I, and, you know, I do set rat traps and I, it's funny because one of the, two of the reviews of my new book, they both mentioned how they disagreed with how, what I said about setting kill traps for rats. And I'm like, you know, there's a thing, there's a predator prey life cycle <laughs> and the predators take a lot longer to reproduce than the prey do. And so in order to maintain balance, we have to do something to either bring in more predators or reduce the prey. And that's, it's for me, it's about balance. And I've been vegetarian for almost 30 years. And so I think consciously about killing something before I do, but I am, you know, when you have planted a whole bed of cabbage and they come in and gnaw it all down to nubbins every <laughs> year you start to take action uh, you know, and it's like it helps so it does restore balance but it is taking life so I, I want to be completely honest about of that. Course, yeah. of course of course so uh, we're holding a vision for your television show thank you and also for uh, a, a non what did you call it a non-reality tv show could you talk just a little bit about your vision for that and what it could do like what that's about yeah, sure. So since I was in my 20s, I have wanted to do a gardening show that is not re not a makeover show, but just like a let's save the world by gardening. How, let's explore all the interesting and cool modalities out there that are working. And, you know, a lot of the movies, the documentaries about soil health and, and how it sequesters carbon and that kind of stuff is now out there. But that since the, my 20s, I've been wanting to do something like that in a series form on television. So I was, I'm holding this dream to get my own gardening show that is not a makeover show. <laughs> it needs to be <laughs> educational and for gardeners and really juicy about the nerdy, um, you know, fun, cool things that we can do to make a total change on the planet. If we just, you know, I just, I'll throw this out there. It, there's a, there was a white paper report that came out a while ago that basically if if we converted all of the farmable and we're not going to we know that but if we converted all of the farmable land that is being currently farmed in with conventional agriculture right now into regenerative slash no-till practices we would sequester enough carbon in the soil to reverse reverse climate change in five years what yeah what it's it's not that simple of course because there's a lot of politics in agriculture as you know and next time the farm bill comes up to vote you please please pay attention because everybody eats um so but that's the thing is if we you know everyone's like okay if we just plant trees no 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 if we just car sequester carbon in the soil by doing things a little bit differently you know, going back to the way things were done a while ago, um, you know, we, we've, we're a blink really in our evolution and the evolution of this planet. And we've done so much to disrupt the soil that if we just switch that back, we can reverse climate, we'll sequester enough carbon to reverse climate change in five years. That's phenomenal. Yeah. And actually it's so hopeful because I think people are getting to the point of saying, yeah, we've got climate things happening that are really affecting everybody. And to say these kinds of steps that actually will feed us and nourish us. Last question, and, and I could talk to you all night. <laughs> Maybe I will later, but um, people don't realize the difference in the quality of food and the nutritional value and what that does to the body when it's grown organically, you think, well, it's more expensive because you go to the grocery store and the organic stuff is expensive and this is just as good. Could you just talk for a minute about how we interact with true organic food and things that yeah. we can? You know, I tend to stay away from the the health, not the health part, but there are, there are certain claims that 
organic food has higher levels of nutrients than conventional. And I have not seen a study that actually uh, confirms that. So I don't speak about it. But when you think about the entire process that it takes to get food from a farm to your table and every single step of the way in between, the impacts that agriculture has on the land, the planet, our health, the, the runoff of chemical fertilizers, the overuse of water, the, the nitrogen that, you know, from the runoff that causes algae blooms and fish death and dead zones in waterways and pollution in your water and your tap water because it gets into the water table. Um, the, you can either pay at the grocery store or you can pay at the hospital. That's how mm -hmm. I think of it. It really is like that. And, and people, you know, if you aren't able to buy everything organic, then at least revisit every year. There's a group called, it's, is it the Cornucopia Institute? I forget, um, or environmental working group. It's one of those two. And they put out the dirty dozen and the dirty dozen is something if you can only afford to buy some things organic get those 12 things as organic and then the rest are not as bad because they don't hold the residues the skins don't hold the residues or they don't absorb them or they're not grown or they don't need chemicals um, to grow so that's the direction but you know regenerative and, and organic and biodynamic agriculture practices uh, help nurture the soil, sequester carbon, prevent runoff, and do a bunch of things that we don't see, and so we don't think about it. But when it when you buy from people who grow that way, you're supporting that kind of agriculture, and you're not supporting the kind of agriculture that is destroying the planet. So I think of it, I think of it that way in terms of the, the value and the health benefits of organic foods. I love that. So I will, for those of you who would love to know more, and I have to say, visit this website. She's got amazing podcasts. You can sign up for her newsletter. You can ask questions. It's like, really, it's a garden in and of itself of nourishment for anyone from the beginner to a seasoned professional gardener and beyond. So it's Christy Wilhelmy. And it's gardennerd.com. So Christy, I knew it would be wonderful talking to you. It's been an absolute delight. Um, if you were going to tell me what to do tomorrow, if I wanted to start, what, what would be the first thing I would do? Uh, well, I would... <laughs> This is so, so cheesy. Go out and get gardening for geeks. No, I am a geek and I think that's the perfect answer. It's because it has everything I teach in one place. And so if you're looking for some place to start, it's written for beginners to completely go out and start from scratch. So I, I would say that. You can also find lots of information on my website, but but in order to, you know, to start small, just make a list of what you're interested in growing and then start doing your research around how to grow it because it does, you know, it helps to know a little bit about each thing that you want to grow um, and just do it. Just, just go just, out there and that's do That's really the answer to all of it, isn't it? Just yeah. do it. If you, if you have a dream you want to follow, just do it. And if somebody says that it's a failure, it's not a failure. You just learn one of the ways not to do it. Right. And I always say the most people you learn how to garden by gardening. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who tuned in. And uh, it's Christy Wilhelmy and gardener.com. And blessings to everyone. Have a healthy, happy, inspired night. Mwah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye-bye.